Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning's sermon. And um, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 16. And I've entitled the sermon, Let's Get Personal. Because in this passage, Paul gives his personal greetings to, and he names the specific people he knows in Romans chapter 16. And sorry, that he knows in, um, in Rome itself and at the church in Rome. So before we jump right in there, um, let's spend a personal moment with our Lord in prayer together. Father God, we thank you for this morning and a brand new day. It's a special day because you made today. You birthed life into creation and you called it your own and you've called us each by name and you know who are yours and who belong to you. And I pray, Lord Jesus, as Christ followers today, we would worship you from deep within our hearts with deep gratitude for your goodness towards us, your love, your grace, your mercy. And it's a grace and a mercy that knows no end. Because there's never a moment that we deserve it, yet you pour it out upon us. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Bless each person as they um, participate in this service this morning and listen to this message and speak to our hearts so that we would um, also find ourselves um, developing our personal relationships with other Christ followers so that they would be sweet and meaningful, kind of um, like a, a, a perfumed fragrance going up um, for you to enjoy and to smell and to appreciate because you see the love we have for one another as believers. So Lord Jesus, we ask that you bless our time in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right, so um, first two verses, Romans 16, verse 1 and 2, this is what it says. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church of King Crea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you. For she has been a patron of many and of myself as well. So, first point is this. Acknowledge your fellow saints in the Lord. That's what Paul has done. Acknowledge them in the Lord. You see, Paul has acknowledged Phoebe. And he's acknowledged her in the Lord. That you may receive her in the Lord. In other words, a Christian welcome. As saints, in other words, saints referring to God's people, ought to receive one another. So Paul is saying, receive her with a Christian welcome, as in the Lord, what is expected of a Christian, what is expected of a gathering of believers, of the church, be welcoming for another, towards another Christian. Receive her, as you ought to receive one another. Then it says, and help her in whatever matter she may require assistance from you in. Help her. Why? Well, the verse says, for she has been a helper to many. She's proved herself as a servant of the church. That is why Paul is commending her. And folks, this is what I mean when I say in point one, acknowledge your fellow saints in the Lord. It's acknowledging their willingness to serve God and to serve His purposes. My back's taking a little bit of strain this morning. Acknowledge people. Acknowledge fellow Christians. It's not flattery. It's not puffing them up. It's acknowledge them for what they're doing. She has been a helper, including myself. Um, and the Amplified Version says, shielding us from suffering. So she played a role in, in keeping them from being the objects of some form of persecution or suffering as well. But that term helper is a picture of who Phoebe was. She was not, it was not about her being a, um, an upfront prominent person in the church. It was a servant. And Paul is wanting to show that even those who don't seem prominent are still significant. As one um, pastor has said, he says, look at my nose, it's a prominent feature on my face. But I have got some other features that are far more significant, but less prominent. Take, for example, my heart. My heart 
Well, without my heart, I die. Without my nose, I just look ugly. The one's prominent, but not significant. The other one's not prominent, but enormously significant. And Paul is saying, whether, whether you're a saint who, or a Christian in the church who serves God's purposes in the background or in the foreground isn't what matters. Your status, your position, your title, your rank, that's irrelevant. But your service of God is what matters. And because they serve God faithfully, you need to receive them. In other words, folks, acknowledge one another. Acknowledge the service that people bring into the body of Christ. <clears throat> so commend is a strong word. But it means that she is deserving of praise. She's deserving of it. We also need to commend those who have served God's purposes well. Whatever their status within the church, whatever their role, prominent, significant, um, um, or, or not prominent, it, it doesn't matter. They need to be acknowledged. Now, as I've said already, this is not flattery. It's giving honor where honor is due, and it's all pointing to Jesus. It's all pointing to God. It's not about the individual. It's about how they've been used of service for God, and God must get the glory. You see, giving honor where honor is due is not about saying of individuals that, look what you did, we're so proud of you. It's more than that. It's saying, we're so proud of you. The whole point here is that to honor someone is, yes, you're proud of their actions, but you're actually grateful that they've been used by God in the service of God for the kingdom of God, and God must get the glory. It's not about them getting a plaque to put up on their wall, to kind of think, look at me. The phrase, welcome her in the Lord, shows us that Christ is still our primary focus and object of worship. Because of her faithfulness, we worship God. Her faithfulness points us to God. You see what Paul's saying here? That's why you can honor her for what she's done. Because her faithfulness points us to God, doesn't detract from God. God is still our primary focus and the object of our worship. We must never worship people. So when we acknowledge people, we don't worship them. We just acknowledge them. You can praise people, but God must always get the glory. Remember that. If people get the glory, you've taken away from God. And God hates that. He despises that. That is a sin, folks. When we take the glory away from God. So we can praise people for the role and the works they've played. But we must always do it cautiously, considering God and that God gets the glory. But cautiously because we never want something to go to an individual's head. For a person to get a big head and think, look at me. In other words, the truth about acknowledging Christians who are serving God's purposes obediently is that you can't acknowledge them without also acknowledging God in it. So God ultimately gets the glory. Okay, so with regards to that first point um, of acknowledging your fellow saints in the Lord. Something to ponder for you to think about doing because we need to put this into action. And so maybe you know of someone who has served God's purposes well behind the scenes. That person who, who is not prominent, but plays a significant role. Maybe the church doesn't even know it. But you know about the things they're doing to serve God's purposes, to be an ambassador for Christ in the world, to be a parable of Jesus to someone else. Maybe you've seen it happening. You know a friend down the road who's constantly doing things to meet others' needs, and they're just quietly getting on with it because it's their way of serving God. Well, I want to encourage you. Why not acknowledge them? If you're part of a church in the same church together, you could make that a public acknowledgement. Or you could just do it privately as the Lord leads you. Never with big fanfare. Just an acknowledgement that says thank you. Thank you for your service in the Lord. And to God be the glory. 
You see, folks, it can be an enormous encouragement to people who are behind the scenes doing things, often not even aware that, that it's making a difference in the kingdom. Most people will acknowledge that they don't want to get the glory, that they don't want to even be named. But it's encouraging to know that your ministry, your service, is having an impact. And this is the word that I want us to consider, um, this word impact. I once did a series around the, the subject of impact. And impact is, is the idea of leaving a lasting impression on something. And so if you take a drop or, uh, or even a stone and you just drop it into water, you'll see the, the ripples that flow out from that. And it, the, the impact of that stone in the water creates these ripples and they, and they spread out evenly um, as they go out in a circle. And that's the impression they leave. That's the impact. And it spreads out. Now the impact we, we leave on people can be good or bad. can be positive or negative. Um, it can be big or can be small. Um, that's, that's the reality of, of leaving an impact. But when we acknowledge one another, folks, we leave an impression on that person's heart. And that can impact their lives. Acknowledging people can impact their lives. And in fact, it can catapult them, motivate them into serving God with more passion and enthusiasm. And so the concept of impact is important. And our lives are to have an impact in, in 360 degrees. In every direction we go, in every aspect of life, in every role we play, our lives should be leaving a lasting impression that points people to Jesus. And so whether it's just with a stranger, or it's with your work colleagues, or it's with a family member, whatever you do, however you do it, let your life be a conduit of Christ's love to other people. Let your life be a parable of Jesus to the world, to both your Christian fellows and to lost people out there in the world that need Jesus. Have an impact. And you have an impact when you acknowledge people and you thank people. It's a vital thing. Now we're going to move on to our second point. Because what we see here in, in these verses is commendations... For service, And so let's have a look at, at um, a couple of verses. We're going to look from verse uh, 3 to verse 6 now. From verse 3 to verse 6. And this is what it says from the English Standard Version. Greet Prisca, Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. So he says, greet them. Now we don't know that much about Prisca and Aquila, but they seem to be a couple. All right. There are mentions of them elsewhere. And it says this of them, who risked their lives or their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Eponetus, who was the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who has worked hard for you. Now, folks, there is no mistake about what God intended to include in Scripture. Lists of names often puzzle us, don't they? Especially if they give us no real insight or details into the people's lives. But this list gives us more detail than most. Paul mentions a list of names of people he actually knew. And even though they were part of the Church of Rome, a church he had not yet been to, he hadn't yet visited, therefore he, there were many in that church he didn't know. There were some with whom his path had crossed. And so, because he knew a good number of them, he mentions them by name. And he acknowledges them, like we say, in, like I said in the first point. But now, he wants to add to these, this list of names and he wants to commend people for certain things. And so in a few short sentences, he gives us details beyond the cultural norm for greetings. He actually commends them. 
So the cu cultural norm wouldn't be to, to, to call a person out and, and acknowledge a whole bunch of things that they've done. He actually commends them. Ponder on what Paul has to say about the following people. We've already said about Phoebe, right? Phoebe. What do we know about Phoebe? She's a sister in Christ. So we know she's a Christian. She's a servant of the church in King Korea, And she's a helper of many as well as Paul. We know that about her. So we see in her these qualities. And he commends her to the church in Rome because of those qualities. Now you get Priscilla. Not Priscilla. Prisca and Aquila. Okay, I've spelt it incorrectly, or maybe it was my predictive text that corrected it. What do we know about them? They were fellow workers of Paul. They put their lives at risk for him and were appreciated by all believers who knew them. So they have qualities that make them commendable to the church. They have qualities that show that they are serving God's purposes. And Paul is ready to acknowledge those kind of things in people. Now, Eponetus. What do we know about Eponetus? We know that Eponetus was the first convert to Christ in Asia. I mean, that is quite something. Now, it's not something that Eponetus wears on his shoulder as a, a badge of honor. I was the first. That's not what it's about. It's about acknowledging that this was the starting point of the impact of the work of the Holy Spirit through the ministry of Paul and others in that area, in Asia. And so we rejoice, and Paul reckons it's important to just make, point, make a point. Eponetus was that person that, that came to know Christ first. Now we've got Mary. What do we know about Mary? Well, she has worked hard for the benefits of the church in Rome. She's a hard worker. Paul acknowledges hard work. Paul approves of hard work. And Paul approves of hard work that's hard work in the right direction. And in her case, it was her tireless work in the church that he's writing a letter to. Whatever that work looked like, Paul doesn't go into details like that. He just acknowledges them. And the people who were receiving the letter would have probably gone, Oh yes, Mary, we know Mary. Wow, that's absolutely fit. That's fitting that Mary gets um, acknowledged for her hard work. We concur is kind of the thing that Paul, uh, sorry, those members in Rome, the church in Rome would be saying. Each of these people that Paul mentions were serving God through the entire list all the way through to verse 16. Mostly behind the scenes and yet Paul commends them. Folks, what does that mean? It means nothing we do in obedience is insignificant to God. In fact, those who serve God behind the scenes do far more for the kingdom of God than any prominent Christian individual ever will. And so you might look at the tele-evangelists or the household names or the popular people in ministry in the world throughout the centuries and think, wow, what could I ever do that could meet up, that could compare with what they've done? Paul is saying it's not about that. Paul is saying serve God's purposes faithfully. And it will be easy to commend you to others in the Lord because of what you're doing for the Lord. But what, what he's ultimately saying is that even if you think it's insignificant or not very prominent, the ministry that you're doing, it's very behind the scenes. Paul is saying there's every likelihood that your impact could be more powerful than the impact of those pastors who are leading mega churches. So let's not get this all skewed. In God's economy of things, in His scale, you don't really know which one tips the balance in terms of serving God's purpose as well. That's a very important point to acknowledge. Don't ever feel like your contribution doesn't matter. Folks, it matters. It really does. Our little church was started because one woman said, Lord, what do we do with these saints that are heading off in different directions to other churches? How do we pull them all together? How do we continue to serve God together? And she said, Chad, would you be willing to start a Bible study with this little group? 
And then that, when that group met to talk about it, they said, well, Bible study is great, let's do that, but church, church is even better. And from the first day we met, we knew we were a church. We praise God for that. One person's obedience to the prompting of the Holy Spirit who took action with regards to that. We praise the Lord for that. So when it comes to obedience, when it comes to being able to have been commended, we need to think about it for a moment. So think for a moment of the implications of the actions of each of these friends of Paul. Everyone played their part. Take Mary with her being one who worked tirelessly, who, who was a hard worker in the church. We need these hard workers who get on behind the scenes. We need that. And um, we, we think about uh, Prissa and, and, uh, and Aquila and their willingness to risk their lives. And about Phoebe. And, and, and most commentators believe Phoebe was actually carrying the letter that Paul had written to the church in Rome, to the church in Rome. And so she was carrying the letter and she's commended first as one that you can, um, she's a real fellow Christian. These are positive things, folks, and we need to think about the implications. As I said, the ripple effect, the impact that their actions of obedience had on the church and on other people's lives. The impact we can have for the kingdom of God is worth considering, whether big or small, whether significant or seemingly insignificant, whether prominent or behind the scenes. It doesn't matter. When you are obedient to God's word and the prompting of the Holy Spirit, you can have an impact for God beyond your imagination. You and I won't always get to see evidence of the impact we've had. We might not even know some of the amazing life change that has taken place because of our own actions. But no matter. Paul is saying it is worth acknowledging believers for what they've done in their service of God. Honor them, but see that God gets the glory. And secondly, we've recognized with regards to our ministry to one another in the body of Christ is that people can be commended for what they've done in serving God. We've spoken about acknowledgement. Commending them takes that word a little bit, makes it a little bit stronger. And, and we can look for things to commend people on. It's about acknowledging someone and saying, man, I just want to encourage you because that word that you spoke really encouraged me. Or the way you run your family is a blessing to me and I want to say thank you. Because it stands out and God gets the glory. Folks, when we do that, this commending of people in the service of the Lord... It does not have to be public like this was fairly public. What Paul was writing a letter with their names, it was public. It doesn't always have to be public. But if it is public, God must get the glory. Always God must get the glory. And so, I want to close with just this thought. Because this picture of having an impact for Christ in the lives of others is accompanied by something else that I see sort of as a message between the lines of Scripture here in verse 16. And I want to say this, point three, never do Christianity alone. Never do it alone. That's why the church exists, so that we don't do, do our walk with the Lord alone. But we can become so isolated from one another, even though we attend church together week in and week out. We don't want that. Now, if you read from verse 7 to 9 in the LEB translation, it says the following. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my compatriots and my fellow prisoners who are well known to the apostles, who were also in Christ before me. Greet Ampliatus, my dear friend in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my dear friend Statius. Now, this is a list of names and Paul having them as friends might seem irrelevant to us. But it's highly relevant 
because Paul chose not to do Christianity alone. Folks, he doesn't call these people just as just kind of fellow workers. He actually calls them friends, co-workers, compatriots, close to him. And that cannot happen without effort and work on his part. He had to initiate and develop those relationships in whatever shape or form. And we need to understand that from this. I mean, you, you look at Andronicus and Junior, they were in prison with him. So they, there was a strong bond there. They bore the beatings he bore. They experienced what he experienced. They were, they were suffering for Christ with Paul. Clearly a strong bond. A deep and abiding friendship. But folks, we will struggle in our walk with the Lord without close friends. And the reason I say never do Christianity alone is because close brothers and sisters in the Lord keep us walking the walk, talking the talk, living by example, and prevent us, help to prevent us from falling into sin. Men, Sometimes you need other men in your lives to, to help challenge you, to help encourage you, and to help you deal with those sins that are peculiar to men that women don't necessarily often understand. And you need brothers who keep you accountable and, and challenge each other to say, are we honoring God? Are we living pure lives? Are we keeping our minds and our hearts pure and clean from, from sin and lustful thoughts to the glory of God? And so you need friends that encourage that and and as I close, I want to mention, and, and sorry, what, ladies, you need those friends in your lives. Female friends that keep you accountable, that help you in your walk with God, that, that, don't, that don't get drawn into your gossip, but actually challenge it so that you live godly lives that, that prove and appreciate who God is in your life and that challenge you from falling into sin. And we've got to make sure that we don't fall into sin and we need each other. Gordon MacDonald, great author, well-known pastor, fell from grace. He had an extramarital affair and, and after that all came out. And he worked through the years after that of being restored to his wife and slowly restored in ministry again. But after that devastating blow that came because of his indiscretion and his sin, he was asked once by someone, what would you do differently? What would you have done differently back then? And he said, I would have had more male friends. You see, folks, he was saying, I didn't have people in my life to keep me accountable. I was surrounded by people, but I was accountable to none. Because I had no strong Christian friends. Folks, don't do Christianity alone. So we've pondered on what it means to acknowledge other believers, to commend people um, to others and to the Lord. But it's all about impact. It's all about leaving a lasting um, impression on people that is godly and that is God-glorifying. And with that in mind, we can get personal. We can talk about people, not in a gossiping way, but in a loving way, in a building up way. And that's what Paul is talking about in Romans when he talks to us and he says, build one another up. Build one another up. That's, that's what we get the opportunity to do as Christ followers and, and a group of believers who meet in a local church. And if you belong to a different local church, that's where you get to flesh out the reality of building others up, of Letting your life impact others and leaving a lasting impression for God's glory and for the kingdom of God. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. God bless you and have a great weekend.